Okay. All right. Well, here we are for another another Wednesday night Bible study. And I hope that you have your lessons. If not, you can follow along. We're in Colossians chapter 3. And uh, we're at verse number... Let's see. I mean, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 10. Verse number 10. So, um, where is that thing going? Okay, all right. So, um, we're going to pray and get right into the Word of God. We're going to start on time today. Hey, Gwendolyn, uh, good to see you online this, this evening. Um, sorry about last week. I don't, I don't, I don't know what happened. It just kicked off, and um, uh, hopefully, uh, it won't kick off tonight. And we'll keep everybody on. But we're in Colossians chapter two, and we're down to verse number ten, I think. Um, so let me see in this lesson where we are. I did the rest of the lesson. Some of the emails are not working, so I can't get you the. Um, email um, simply because it's not working. So um, we're going to start at verse 6 where we're going to start at. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for this evening. God, I pray for the believer. I pray for the just for the believers in particular, Lord, especially those who are seem to be losing their, their, their love for you, God. It's like it said in... Um, revelations that they left their first love and so many people are going through so many people are having challenges and and lord i just pray in the name of jesus that we don't lose our hope and our faith in you i know situations and challenges things are going to happen lord but i pray that your word will sustain us i pray for those who have already uh, petitioned you or for one thing or but something else, God, I lift them up in the name of Jesus. I pray that we will all read Philippians um, 4, 6, and 7, where you tell us worry about nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving unto the Lord. Father, may we simply apply the principles of the word. And I know that things aren't going to always go the way we want them to go. But the Bible says you're the potter and we're the clay. And you can do unto the clay as you see fit. So, Lord, may we begin to live by your patience. May we continue to trust you at your word. Lord, that's my prayer today for the believers, for those that's going to come online. That's my prayer that we don't allow ourselves to get caught up. And, Lord, even though we're in these human bodies and, and sometimes we allow what we see with our eyes to, to impact us, Lord God, I pray that we remember the scripture. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. He didn't say when or how, but you simply gave us a promise. And so I pray in Jesus' name that we don't, don't let go of the word of God. We don't allow people to cause us to walk away from the very thing that saved us and the very word that keeps us and strengthens us, even in the most difficult times. Father, I pray for pastors and preachers all over the world those here in the United States of America, I lift them up, God, that they will simply preach the gospel truth, simply preach the word of God. I pray this, Father, and I come to you, the only God and creator of all life, in Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Monica, how you doing? Carl Watson, Gwendolyn, and of course, my sister Ernestine Miles, blessings to you guys this morning. I mean this evening. Oh, uh, let's go to Colossians chapter two, and let's look. Let's pick up there where Paul is talking to the to the Colossians, those in Colossae, and he's just giving them some some really um, um, a sound foundational truths. It's just as good today as it was back then. The word has not lost its power. The word has not stopped fulfilling what God has mandated from the day that he spoke it and from the day that he allowed these men to write it. 
God's word is not messed up. People are. God's word cannot be proven wrong. People are. But God's word is true. And we need to hold on to it. Let's start at number six. And Paul said, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, he gives a, a thing. He said, also walk in him. Another way of expressing that is living by the word of God. So you, when you say, when he uses the term walk in him, he's talking about living by the principles of God's word, living um, by the truths of God's word. Of what does it mean to walk with God or to walk in faith with God? Number seven, he said, root, uh, he said, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught. So there are some people that haven't been faith, been taught the truth of God's word, and they can never be rooted in God's word. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Here in verse 6 in the lesson, it says, the apostle Paul gives instructions to the Colossians believer. He said, as ye have therefore received Christ the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And here's where we have the problem is a person can be rooted but not grounded. A person can be rooted and not grounded. Another word for uh, being rooted is is one who who um, let's say comes to church on a regular basis. That person can be rooted in going to church but not grounded in living for God, okay? So the Bible talks about it in Matthew. It talks about those who receive the word on stony ground, those who receive it on shallow ground. And he didn't say they weren't rooted. They weren't grounded because he said as soon as trouble arise, he said they walked away from the truth of God. So if you looked at that, it says um, um, uh, there are many people that are, are can be rooted in a church. That's their church. They go to that church. They continuously attend that church, but they, they never surrender to God. They never surrender to a point to where they are simply living out the gospel message. And so soon as trouble comes or soon as the situation arises that their abilities, their finances, their connections, their family can't help them with, they move away from the faith in God. And that is seen on a regular basis a lot with, with believers. Because you know yourself whether or not you're rooted in God. You're rooted in his word. And I, I know for a fact that you can tell when you're rooted is when you begin to live out this message. Wait a minute. Timmy, tell him go down to the bottom door. So, so here it is in verse number... Um, uh, seven, he said, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. That means you're not wobbling and, and you know, you're not going here and there. One thing that I'm finding is that in James, I'm going to read it to you. And um, James chapter one, I believe. Uh, let me turn to James chapter one. And let me read to you what it says in James chapter one. And, 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 and the word of God is not going to change for you or I. Um, this is one of the things, uh, that, 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 um, he was talking, James was talking to the people that was in his church. He said, uh, he said, let's start at six, but let him ask in faith, not wavering, underline that word, not wavering. Here's the problem with most believers, even myself sometimes that I have to bring myself and keep myself in check. Well, he that wavereth. In and out, up and down. It's like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So, um, driven with the wind and tossed means whatever flavor of society it is. So, you change your mind on God, uh, basically, uh, based on what society has said, or how society think, or even what society calls right or wrong good or evil, all right? So he says, let that man, um, he's driven 
He's driven uh, like the sea with the wind and toss. Number number seven. Now here's the key. Here's the key. You need to get this. For let for James said, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. This is where believers are getting messed up. If you are wavering with God, if you're wavering in your life, you want you wonder why you start something you never finish. You wonder why you you never seem complete. When it comes to your prayer life, you can't be consistent. Even in Bible study, many people are not consistent. In in reading of the Word of God, we're not consistent. We're like a wave being tossed to and fro, whatever the, wherever we land at. And then we pray and we ask God and we cry to God. Well, he said in his word, he said, but let him ask in faith, not wavering. Sometimes I waver. I have to catch myself. I'm not, I haven't dotted all the teeth, but I catch myself. He said, for he that wavers like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So you want God to answer that prayer when you're not consistent with him. You want God to violate his word and he can't do that. Next verse. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's talking about believers. And he's not talking about sinners because a sinner, he, his mind is already made up. He's going to sin. He's going to live. He's going to live his life according to to uh, the mandates of Satan. He's just going to keep going that way. But a believer, you have to choose how you're going to live every day. And so we pray and we ask God, but yet we're like this guy. We flip-flopping him. You pray sometimes, sometimes you don't. When God don't answer your prayers, you get mad. You stop coming to church. You, you stop uh, um, doing the things you were doing with God. God always get cuts off first. So let's get back to Colossians. Are you rooted? Are you not just rooted, but are you grounded? And you can do the litmus test for yourself. When the last incident or event transpired in your life, what was your reaction? What was the first thing you did when it was out of your control to correct it, to turn it, to fix it? What was your first response? And whatever your first response is, is where your heart is, okay? No matter what we say, that's where your heart is. Your heart is, 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 is in that particular place. So the question is, are you rooted? And if you are rooted, it should be some fruits of being rooted. And that means that we are solidly tied to onto the word of God, okay? So let's go down to verse number... Eight. He said, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and that after Christ. And so one of the questions I have here, we can compare Apostles Paul's statement in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. If you continue in the faith, there it is, there it is again. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, grounded and settled, and that be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Wherefore Paul said, "I'm made a minister." Okay, I'm made a minister. So here's here's one of the things I wanna I wanna ask you. That comes out of Colossians chapter one, by the way. What does it mean to be rooted? Would be rooted. Another word for rooted is consistent, stable in a particular uh, thing. I'm, I'm stable. I'm consistent with it every day. You go to work every day. You're consistent in going to work. Another thing you're consistent in, you're consistent in making sure your money in your account when it's time to get paid. You don't forget. You don't forget that. You don't forget that you're getting that check every two weeks or every week. You're consistent with it. Well, why can't we take that same consistency and bring it into our natural life to where we're living for God? Okay. What does it mean to be established in the faith? It's different to be rooted and another one to be established. That means establish how? Established by the word of God. Number nine, 
He says, for in him dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In who? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. This is what I wrote um, in, in the lesson. It says, too many times we quote scripture without ever allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us. How does the Holy Spirit teach us? Well, he uses Holy Ghost men and women who themselves have been taught the basic principles of God, God's word, as it relates to the truth. The Holy Spirit then expands our understanding as we study the scripture within small groups or as an individual. Some such as myself attend Bible college, and I've had some fantastic teacher, teachers who would challenge me to dig deeper for God's truth. As a matter of fact, I'm still attending Bible classes so that I can be an effective teacher. We should never allow ourselves to become dormant and stale when it comes to Bible study or Sunday school or Sunday morning service uh, messages. These are given for our learning and growing in God's word. This is a problem we have in church is how you grow is what you are, have been taught. And when we teach you God's truth, the Holy Spirit then expands on that truth through your experience, through your studying, through your reading and your praying. So if you're not doing any of those things, many people are drinking nothing but milk and don't have the heart to go to um, um, eat, eating meat to where we can then share with others this great and powerful word and truth of God's word. I can't express in this day and time, people don't want to hear the gospel. Even believers don't even want to go to church no more. Many of them sit home and watch TV hour after hour after hour. And then when trouble arises, you want God to simply snap his fingers or blow his breath over your situation so that it goes away. Let me tell you something. Consistency is important for you. It's important for you to maintain a consistent relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So he says, number 10, verse 10, he says, and ye are complete in him. When are we complete in him? We're complete the day we're saved. He completes us. He fills us with the Holy Ghost. He forgives us of our sins. All that, he completes himself in us. Now he's bringing to a place of perfection and maturity in him that we will learn the word of God, apply the word of God, okay? So, um, Paul is again giving us some instructions. Verse, verse number 9, 10, 11. Look what he says in verse 11. He's telling, he's talking to uh, the church there. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. So now Paul has shifted gears all the way because one thing about Paul, he knows the law. He was brought up in the law. So now Paul's talking about circumcision. Not, we don't, as a kid, most male boys had to be circumcised. Mostly all male boys, boys were circumcised. And so circumcision in the Old Testament is where we got to go to find out um, really, what is Paul talking about? So, he said, In whom also ye are circumcised, made without hands, and putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by circumcision of Christ. So, to fully understand circumcision made without hands, you have to go back to the Old Testament to fully understand circumcision. But it was a covenant that God had given to Moses, and each born male had to be circumcised. You can find that in Genesis chapter 17, verse 10. It was a covenant that God made with Moses and the people of God, that the males had to be circumcised. It was a sign of the covenant. It was a sign of the covenant of God that made with his people uh, this covenant that they were going to become the nation of Israel. And so Paul is saying to the uh, Christians, and, you know, you got these Judaizers who would come and say, oh, no, in order to be saved, you got to be circumcised, just like it is today. Some churches say you have to you have to speak in tongues in order to be filled with the spirit. Some say you have to be baptized in Jesus name in order to be in order to be, be considered saved. 
Some people say you have to tarry for the Holy Ghost. All of these things are, are really, uh, there are no basis in the Bible for any of those man-made doctrines. Those are all works that people simply try to do to get the approval of God. Simply faith in God and living by his word is what God simply requires. So he said, in whom you are also circumcised with the circumcision, he said, made without hands, the cutting away. The cutting away of what? The cutting away of, of flesh, the cutting away of those things that separated us from God, which namely we call sin. He said, in putting off the body, listen, in whom ye are circumcised um, with the circumcision made with our hands, in putting off of the body, look what he says, the sins of the flesh. The what of the flesh? The sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ did the cutting away by his death on the cross. His blood simply redeemed us from the control of, the, of sin that it had on our life and simply gave us a new seed, an incorruptible seed, that now when we begin to live out the word of God, that seed begin to produce the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, uh, uh, long-suffering, kindness. Uh, he said, against such there is no law. So, he said, putting off the body of sins, there's an S there, of the flesh. So, this is why the Bible states that if any man be in Christ, he's a what kind of creature? A new creature. So, whatever we were doing that was sinful, we should stop be doing it. We should stop doing it. A person who, whether he's a liar, he's a thief, he's a murderer, um, he's, going to, he's going to prison. Um, a homosexual, transgender, those things are sinful. And so there should be a change in your life. Here's a question I want to ask, and I'm going to ask it Sunday as well. Those of us on this line right now, and those who will watch this later on, we know what sin is. We're not oblivious to what sin is. We know what right and wrong is. Even before we got saved, we knew what right and wrong was. Okay? But here's my question. Knowing God's truth, knowing God's word, reading God's word, having been taught God's word, why is it sometimes that we give in to our sinful desires. Why do we give in to our sinful desires? Knowing what we know. Yes, we have 1 John 1 and 9 that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And clean. But why do we do it, Timmy? Um, because the, uh, the flesh and the spirit is always worn together. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up. Timmy brought up what Paul has said in Romans. And Paul said, when I try to do good, he said, I find myself doing it. And when I try not to do it, he said, I find myself doing it. So let's go over to Romans chapter 7. I want to explain that. And people use this as an excuse to justify their sin. You can't justify sin. You confess it. You acknowledge it. So you can be delivered from the power of it. But no, there's not a human being can justify what they did outside of God's word. Nothing. I don't care how bad it was. You can't justify it. You can't justify killing somebody because they did something to you. You can't justify stealing because you don't have. You can't justify lying because you're trying to get out of something. There's no justification for sin. Look what Paul said in Romans chapter 7. Paul says um, in verse number 15, But that which I do, I allow not. But what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Now then, it is no more I that doeth it, and then Paul said, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's an excuse. Paul saying, look, I do it, but he said, the reason I, because it's, it's the sin that making me do it. 
Amen. That's what he's saying. This is, now you really you gotta real, you gotta realize Paul is talking as he's growing in God. Amen. He's talking about the inner wherefore he was having. Okay. Look what he says in 18. For I know that in me that is in my what? Flesh, Amen. in my desire, the well of what? No good thing. For to will is present with me. Paul said, inside of me is the desire to want to do right. He said, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now, you need to stop right there. He said, he said um, for the good which I would, I do not. Why? Because Paul is saying, I, I haven't really fully embraced God's teaching yet. Because the Bible says whatever is, is, is not a faith is sin. So he said, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I do. He said, he said, um, oh, no, go back to 18. But how to perform? He said, I, have, I, I just haven't uh, uh, obeyed the word or been taught it of how to perform that which is good. He said, I haven't gotten it yet. Next verse. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, he said, I find myself doing it. Number 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it. And then Paul said, I do it because of the sin that dwelleth in me. How many Christians use that? I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So Paul is saying, he's talking about his old nature and his new nature. I'm teaching on the power of consequence when you choose, you know, the power of choice. You have the power of choice. Amen. He said, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Paul said, I delight in the law of God because the law reveals sin. The law, you can't keep the law. But Paul said, because I was raised in the law and because I understood the law, he said, I delight in the law because at least when I looked at the law, I knew what I was reading. I knew that murder was wrong. I knew that stealing was wrong when I looked at the law, and I delighted in it. But I couldn't keep it. I didn't know I couldn't perform it because I didn't have no power in myself to perform it. That's what Amen. Paul is saying. Amen. All right? He said, but I see another law in my member, warring against the law of my, what, mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my member. He said, I, I, I know what the law, I, I practice the law. I live by the law. And, and, I, and I see this war of trying to obey God's word and then again trying to fulfill the lust of my flesh. Then Paul says in 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the death of this, from the body of this what? So what was he talking about? He's talking about the sin that the sin, but the sin in his body. Who would deliver me from this? And here's the part we skip over. <laughs> I thank God. He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. So Paul is not dependent on the law anymore. He's not making excuses for the law. Amen. So then with the mind, he said, with the mind, I myself serve the law. I, in other words, I have an understanding of the practicality of what the law says. But with the flesh, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Uh, let me go back to that. He said, he said, no. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. So he said, with my mind, be renewed my mind. He said, I serve God, but I also understand with the flesh that, that what sin is. What sin is. All right? So... So Paul had this understanding that, that, that he couldn't make this excuse no more. You can't use that excuse because you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has given you power over sin. Amen. The Bible says sin shall not have what over you? Dominion. dominion. Oh, what does that mean to you? What does that mean when he control. says sin shall not have dominion over you? Control. control. Timmy says control. It shall not have control over you. Before sin had what over you? Control over you. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3. All right. So we've been circumcised. That means that, 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 that um, there's a cutting away. The circumcision means a cutting away. When we submit to God's word uh, by faith in Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ, there's a cutting away. There's a cutting away. 
that gives us the ability by the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to make a choice to, to, to obey God over the desires of the flesh. All of us fight with the desires of the flesh. There's not a human being, I don't care how long you've been in church, I don't care how known that you think you are, all of us have to deal with the desires of the flesh and bring it under control. God has given the ability to bring it under control. So that's what Paul in 11 verse was talking about, circumcision. In whom ye also circumcised with the circumcision made with our hands in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Number 12, buried with him in baptism. Buried with him in baptism. What did that mean to you? Wherefore also ye are risen with him through the, through the faith of the operation of who? God. What is Paul talking about the operation of God? He's talking about the death of Jesus on the cross. Who have raised him from the dead. Okay? That's why our justification comes from. It comes from the blood of Jesus. His death on the cross. Number 13. And you being dead in your sins. Now, now, many people can't underline that. And you, because you've been, you accepted Christ, you've been circumcised in your heart by the Spirit of the Lord, spiritual surgery, in other words, buried with him in baptism. He said, and you being dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh. That means the cutting away, the cutting away. To stop feeding, to stop giving into your flesh. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of how many of your trespasses? All. Having forgiven you of all your trespasses because of your faith in, in Jesus Christ. God has forgiven you. And forgiven you how many of your trespasses? All of your trespasses. All right? So Paul is talking from the law perspective because that's what Paul grew up in, that's what he was taught. All Hebrew boys are taught the law, all right? And so Paul is making this comparison. He's trying to, he's trying to make it simple. He's trying to simplify it for the people so they can get an understanding of what Paul's talking about because we don't hear nothing about circumcision today. Nobody talks about, you know, my, I know in the older folks, they used to go around and used to say, you had that boy circumcised yet? It was something that they did. Where did that come from? It came out of the Bible. It came out of the Bible. So they would circumcise all the males. All the males had to be circumcised to come in the covenant with God. Because if in the Old Testament, if you were uncircumcised, you could not partake in, in any of the atonement. You couldn't partake in any of the feasts of anything if you weren't circumcised. You was considered an outsider. So Paul said, now no more circumcision of the flesh. Now it's of the heart. It's a cutting away of the pain and the hurt and a disappointment that you have caused yourself and that we have caused others. The, uh, Gwendolyn said the flesh is weak. Let's talk about that. What in the world does that mean, the flesh is weak? The flesh, this right here, it, it, it's, what, it's what the mind uses and the devil uses to carry out sinful deeds. It's what the Holy Spirit uses to carry out good deeds to the glory of God. This, this flesh, this flesh is going to go back to the dust of the earth. Worms are going to eat it up. It's going to turn back to dust. So what is really weak in an individual? What's, what's really weak in us that we give in to our fleshly desires? Amen. Sex out of sex outside of marriage, stealing, backbiting, lying, cheat. What where does that come from? Our first nature. April says our first nature is what we used to. So when it says when she says the flesh is weak, it means that our minds haven't been renewed because the flesh can't do anything without the mind telling it. The desires start here. The dopamine in your mind, the sexual, uh, the sexual um, um, things that transpire in our mind, it starts, it starts right here. Thought starts right here in the mind. Go, go, go over to Romans chapter twelve. Amen, Pastor. Write this down so you can go to it. When people, I, I love when people bring up stuff. It's, it's, it's not a downer. It's just to make us aware of what we're saying. Okay, so somebody gonna ask you that question. 
They say my flesh is weak. What are you talking about? My flesh is weak. It's, it's you haven't done many kinds. We haven't done this or we get away from it. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices. Number one, he puts holy. Being holy makes it acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, the flesh, your mind, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word of your mind, underline that. The renewing of your mind, okay, there's a renewing of the mind because that's where the trouble starts. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the problem is here. Cabeza. In the mind. Amen, it's where it starts. That's why I said be renewed. How do you renew your mind? Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. You don't renew your mind by simply reading scripture. But that's why we have to do a reminder daily and continually. Yes, we have to do a reminder daily and continually because the devil is going to tempt you. Where's the tempt you at? In your mind. All right? So, um, I renew my mind not by just reading scripture, but I renew is renewed when I begin to obey scripture. You understand? How many people you know out on the street that can quote scripture, but their minds are not renewed? Because a renewed mind means a renewed behavior, a new character. Yes, you have to learn things that you have to live with it. Yes, a new character. That's true. That's true. But we need to we need to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what we're talking about. Okay? So that people don't use their sin as an excuse to do what you did or what you're doing. So yes, that you can have a weakness to where you haven't fully uh, surrendered uh, certain uh, um, um, things to God. I had one guy and and he was smoking one of those uh vapor cigarettes, which which is very unhealthy. And he, so he said, This is a you. I said, No, that's your choice. That's what you choose to do. He said, I need to hold on to something. You can't take everything from me. And that thing just puzzled me. I want God to take away everything. I want everything out of my life. Anything that's going to cause disruption between me and God, I want it out. Um, I'm, there's another scripture um, uh, that I want to turn to. I can't remember it right offhand, but I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, uh, let me see. Um, I think Paul was talking about he said, "Acknowledge or or to folk or to be aware of every sin that so easily beset us. The sins that so easily beset us. If there's one sin in your life that you're dealing with, that you're struggling with, that sin could be a stronghold." That's Hebrews, man. Hebrews. Yeah. Hebrews twelve and one. Said. Timmy said Hebrews twelve and one. I believe I said. Oh, uh, let me turn there right quick. Oh, yeah. He says, wherefore, seeing we are, com we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, he said, let us lay aside every weight. What is weight? That means past sins. Stop beating yourself up. And the sin, and the is singular, and the sin with those so easily beset us, and let us run how? With patience, the race that is set before us. Number two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despite the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, he said, the sin that's so easy beset us, okay? Let's go back over to Colossians chapter 3. We, we got five more minutes. Colossians chapter 3. You should be marking your Bibles up. Amen. All right, need to mark your Bibles up. Okay. So he says in number 13, and you being dead in your sin. Okay, can a dead man sin? 
I'm just asking the question. No. Then he said you should be as a dead man, but you need to identify the sin that so easily, in other words, the word uh, there in the um, in the Greek or Aramaic, besetting uh, uh, means off course. The sin that easily gets you off course. Okay. Um, uh, let me see. Being dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him and hath forgiven you all your trespass. Number 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So he said, though that the, the, but the keeping of the law, the obeying of the law, he said he nailed it to the cross because he fulfilled every aspect of the law. Whether it was a Sabbath, whether it was the new moons, whether it was tithing, all those things was fulfilled that Christ fulfilled on the cross with his blood and nailed it to the cross for us. Number 15, having spoiled principalities and powers. Having spoiled means, means that, uh, you know, when something spoils, what do you do? Throw it out. It means it's no good. Having spoiled principalities and power, he made a show of them openly, triumphantly, triumphing over them, in it, how did he triumph? His resurrection. Amen. His resurrection. That's how he tried. He didn't go down and have a, a fist fight with Satan. He never had. He didn't go to hell. He didn't go into the depths of hell where the rich man was. He was in paradise. And hell was fixed across from paradise. He went down into the earth. They called it, they referred to it as hell. But he did not go into the depths of hell or in that side of, of the earth where the rich man was in Luke chapter 16. We'll talk about that next week. Okay. <clears throat> Number 16. Let no man therefore judge you. And then Paul's talking about, about the law. This is what they were dealing with. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moons or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is a Christ. So Paul said, don't let them push you back, you know, because they had dietary or strict rules in, in the Old Testament of what they could eat and what they couldn't eat. They have uh, ordinances that they had to keep. Um, uh, uh, the atonement of the killing of the animals, the gathering once a year, was all fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. His precious blood fulfilled the requirement that was required by God for you and I, that we don't have to keep these things. And people, you need to keep the Sabbath. You need to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is every day. The reason that God gave them a Sabbath day was for them to stop from working from what they were doing and to meditate on him. And the rest, we need to have Sabbath days someday, every day. You need to take a rest. But the point is, it's okay if you, kept, if you keep the Sabbath. But the point is, the Sabbath doesn't make you holy before God. It doesn't make you righteous for God. It doesn't make you better than the person who doesn't keep the Sabbath. It's not about keeping the Sabbath. It's about living according to God's principles. It's about living holy and righteous in this present time that God has given you the strength to do so. Okay? 18. We're going to stop at 18. Let no man beguile. That word beguile means trick. You of your reward in a voluntary humility. And the worshiping of angels. <laughs> These people, man, that's, that's a whole other subject I'll talk about next week. Intruding into those things which he have not seen. He vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. These people start talking about angels and worshiping of angels. And, and I got these angels following me and, and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. You know, the Bible says do not worship angels. They're not to be worshiped. If an angel is sent, it's sent to minister and to help you. The only worship that we should be doing is to God in the name of Jesus Christ. We don't worship angels. Angels are there to help you. They're held to watch over you. Um, I'm only going, and I had to bring up scriptures to prove that. I just can't say it. I have to back it up. So next Sunday, that's where we'll start at the 18th verse. So we'll be at Colossians 2 and 18, and we're going to be talking about angels. People are pushing people to worshiping of angels, which is really blasphemy. It's a disrespect of God. 
You never find in the Old Testament them worshiping angels. It is a sin to worship angels. They are sent to help you, to guide you as led by the Holy Spirit. All right? We'll talk more about that next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, all we want is your truth because it's the truth that will set us free. There are some confusing things we read in the scripture. There's some things we don't even have answers for. So I'm asking you to open up my mind, our, our insight, give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and revelation that we don't teach the wrong thing, Father. We don't allow erroneous teaching to get us off course of your truth. I pray in the name of Jesus. I die to self. I die to my past. I die to philosophy. Lord, open up my mind to your truth that I may teach it in a clear and concise manner that people do not go away confused. I ask these things. Give us traveling mercies. Keep us from all hurt, harm, and danger, seen and unseen. If we arise tomorrow, may we arise with joy and thanksgiving and giving you praise that we will live that day to your name, in the name of Jesus and to your glory. I thank you for tonight's Bible teaching. I thank you for the people that's online. I thank you that we become consistent in, in just developing and growing in your word. And we don't use excuses for sinning. God, in Jesus' name, you have given us everything to live holy and righteous before you. And you have given us the ability to choose, to choose not to sin, but to live holy and righteous in this present day, in this present time. And I thank you and I honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining tonight. Thank you, Sister Ernestine. Have a blessed day. Hope you're feeling well. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll give you a call. Blessings. Amen. To you. God bless. God bless. Okay, for those of you that are online, thank you so much. Continue to pray. Continue to seek God's face. Become consistent with God, and you'll find a dynamic change in your life. Good night, I'm Monica. Hope you enjoy my favorite restaurant up there. Because, you know, boy, I feel like driving up there, just going to that restaurant, eat some of that food, and coming back home. Don't tempt me now. Don't tempt me. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a wonderful uh, evening. See you next um, Wednesday. And don't forget Sunday service. We're teaching a powerful series on uh, choice. God bless you. Have a good day.